Hello everyone. Um, today I want to do an episodic ataxia video. Um, in this one, I want to try to show you demonstrations as I, you know, kind of explain. Um, I've been explaining a few things here and there in videos, but maybe you get a different idea if I visually show you some things versus me just talking about it. So that's why I wanted to make this video um, and just kind of explain how episodic ataxia works. Um, episodic ataxia is a rare neurological condition and it frequently confuses a lot of people because Sometimes the person, the individual experiencing it, doesn't look like they have ataxia, but they do. Um, this can happen in many different ways, okay? How the symptoms come about can be different per episode, per individual, and so on. It's not a stable ataxia that's slowly progressing in symptoms over a number of years. It is very different than a lot of other ataxias. Um, and the person has intermittent coming and going of symptoms in this condition, episodic ataxia. Um, but despite of the coming and going in between episodes, the person often doesn't look like they have ataxia, but they may show mild symptoms. Um, and you go in to see the neurologist and it can be seen on a neurological exam. As many people go in to see their doctor episode free from obvious symptoms of their attacks of a, ataxia, um, there can still be permanent cerebellar signs. Um, and a lot of people develop like cerebellar atrophy, which is a deterioration of the cerebellum in the back of the brain. Um, that controls voluntary movement and coordination and balance. Um, so many people with episodic ataxia can have that. Um, and it deteriorates over time. And in between episodes, you may notice a slowly worsening of permanent symptoms um, as the disease progresses. So, anyways, in this video, I want to show you some demonstrations. Um, people with episodic attacks experience a variety of symptoms, um, and it varies um, a lot. And it often confuses people because sometimes you are walking normally, like you do not have ataxia. You're not walking with a widened gait, necessarily, um, with your legs spread apart, trying to maintain balance. A lot like this, like a lot of people with ataxia tend to walk a lot like this. Um, and many people with a stable, permanent, and progressive ataxia notices a, um, a deterioration in their gait from walking like this and over time you start to notice a slowly um, worsening of the symptoms or gait okay episodic ataxia doesn't necessarily work this way I mean it does but it doesn't um, people with episodic ataxia do have permanent cerebellar symptoms it can appear very mild. So a person with episodic ataxia that can have a permanent ataxia in between having their episodes. So the person would walk into the doctor's office just like this, okay? They do not have a wide gait like I showed you. It looks like a normal gait, but, um, when they attempt to walk heel to toe, each time going in to see their neurologist, they 
appear very unstable and wobbly like this. And it's like a permanent symptom. Yet they can still walk normally as if you do not have ataxia. So, I mean, it's there, but it doesn't look like it's there. Um, this can be a permanent sign when going into the doctor's office. You know, you're having trouble walking heel to toe in a person with episodic ataxia with each attempt um, because it's permanent. Me, on the other hand, I do not appear to have this issue. So, um, I totally look fine. So, I'm walking. It does not appear I have ataxia unless I feel an episode coming on. So, a lot of times I walk heel to toe just perfectly, just like I am right now. But when I feel an episode coming on, I tend to walk heel to toe like this, and I'm very wobbly. And it only occurs when I feel an episode coming on. So it's kind of like coming and going in intermittent um, symptoms. And it's not always seen when going into the doctors and doing in the neurological exam when the doctor asks you to walk heel to toe. Um, so even during the onset of some of my episodes, I tend to do that. I can walk heel to toe pretty wobbly, but sometimes it doesn't look like I have a wide gait and I'm walking normally. Unless if I'm having a severe episode. So, when I have a severe episode, I tend to look like I walk more like this as I'm trying to widen my stance or gait to maintain my balance. And other times I do require a wheelchair when it happens. Um, however, because my heel to toe uh, balancing um, is totally coming and going, um, based on my symptoms and episodes compared to some other people that have it permanently due to their episodic ataxia. When they have it permanently and they're totally impaired from walking heel to toe um, with each attempt, they do still have episodes in addition to it. It just worsens the symptoms. So in other words, um, let's say you have a permanent symptom of, and you have a diagnosis of episodic ataxia. You have a permanent symptom of uh, being unable to walk heel to toe, for instance. Um, and you um, have an episode it brings it out a lot more. It brings out the symptoms a lot more rather than, and when the episode passes, you do not return to a totally normal, you still continue to have these milder symptoms. Um, that's how it works with episodic ataxia. I know this because it's inherited in my family and it runs in my family. And this is what I've witnessed um, when it comes to the symptoms of episodic ataxia. A lot of people have an eye condition or involuntary eye movements called nystagmus, which tends to occur in between episodes or they are worsened by episodes. Um, but it's usually permanent, so it can be seen like in between episodes. However, when an episode comes on, it can worsen it. Um, just the same way. So when you move your eye back and forth, there's often a jerking effect that takes place um, with your eye movements in episodic ataxia. Um, there are known to be eight types of episodic ataxia, and I do not I do not know if it applies to all types. They're all very different. Um, so 
but this is how I've seen it happen in my family history and based on my experience with it. Some people with episodic ataxia also has this other condition called dysmetria, which I have. Each time I go in to see the neurologist, they tell me I have a bit of dysmetria. This is often tested in finger to nose testing. So the neurologist asks you to touch your finger to your nose and they're asking you to touch their other finger, their finger um, at a distance. And you do that like this and they move their finger over in different areas, different directions as they're asking you to keep touching their finger to your nose um, like that. Um, which has shown that I have some dysmetria and I always have it even though I'm not in an episode of my ataxia. So that has been seen um, and noticed when I went in. Um, some people with episodic ataxia also have tremors despite of their um, episodes, which can be seen in the finger to nose testing as well. It's like an intention tremor. As they're attempting to do the finger to nose, you notice the neurologist notices a little shake. Your doctor um, will notice your shaking. Um, so that's a little bit of general info I wanted to share you um, on how episodic ataxia works. It's very complicated and it's hard to understand. It's more complex than what people think about episodic ataxia. People think, well, you just have episodes or periods of ataxia. It's more complicated than that um, because <laughs> of all these other things that correlate to the disease. So I wanted to explain that further and give you some demonstrations on how it works um, based on my experience and whatnot. So bye now.